those passages we chanted just now. Contemplation of the body, the five recollections on aging, illness, death, separation, and the fact of karma. Those are probably the most standard passages you'll hear chanted in Thai forest monasteries. They provide an important background for the meditation to remind us of where the important things in life really are. It's the karma, that very last topic. It's the things we do. Where do things we do come from? They come from the mind. It's where actions have value and our mind has a value as a result, because the mind has an influence on the pleasure and the pain we meet with in life. And as for the issues of the body, those have to be secondary. We can't let the body take too much importance in our lives. If the body becomes a big issue, then you have to worry about it. Not getting enough food and getting enough sleep and taking care of it. And many times you're not willing to sacrifice it for the sake of the practice, for the sake of developing skillful qualities in the mind. So it's good to get things into proper perspective. And our strength in the practice does come primarily from the mind. The body may play a part, and the Buddha recognizes that fact. He says it's one of the essential elements of being able to really give yourself totally to the practice, that the body is in basic good health. But the standards for basic good health can vary from culture to culture. And if you basically meant that your digestion is okay, that you're strong enough to sit and practice. And if you're, if you're not that strong, you can still do the practice and get a lot of good results from it. There's a talk that John Lee gave to the old woman who was dying. And he pointed out that we live through strength of body and strength of mind, but it's the strength of mind that really matters. So that's what we've got to work on. We can't let the issues of the body get in the way. There's a humorous passage in the canon where the Buddha talks about the different ways that people become lazy or energetic. And the external situation is the same in either case. He talks about a person who's about to go on a journey, he says, well, I'm going to go on a journey tomorrow, so I better rest up today, so he doesn't meditate. As opposed to the person who says, I have to go on a journey tomorrow, I won't have much time to meditate while I'm on my journey, so I should meditate now. The person who doesn't get much to eat. The lazy person says, well, I didn't get much to eat today, I'm not strong, I better rest a lot. And the other person says, I didn't get much to eat today, the body is light, not weighed down, I'm not getting drowsy from having eaten too much. Ideal time to meditate. And so on down the line. In other words, the energy that we put into the practice doesn't have to depend on the situation outside. It depends on our attitude. And the attitude has to be fed by heedfulness. One of the situations in that sutta is of a person who's just recovered from an illness. He says to himself, well, I'm still not quite well, so I better rest. That's one person. The other person says, I've just recovered from the illness. I could have a relapse. I've got a little window of time here. I should meditate. That thought comes from heedfulness, the realization that you don't know how much time you have. You don't know whether your energy tomorrow is going to be good or not, but you do have enough energy now to practice, so you should put it into the practice. Rather than being overly concerned with the body. This is a matter of balance, but you look in our culture and the balance tends to go way in the direction of the body. Keeping it strong. You can hear people talking about how it's important that we embody enlightenment in our practice, that celebrating the body is an important part of the 
spiritual tradition that's underestimated or undervalued in Buddhism, and it's time we brought it back in. Well, that's it's not Buddhism. It's not the Dharma. It's defilement talking. Our main source of energy is that realization that our actions are important. The training of the mind is important. And as for the body, you want to use it as a tool in the practice. You look after it the way you would with any tool. But you have to have a sense of proportion in how you look after it, what's really necessary to keep the body strong enough to practice. And then beyond that, your emphasis should be on developing the strength of the mind. <coughs> It's the same as when you hear about people talking about people who are raised in a bad environment, they're poor, disadvantaged. And say, they say, well, no wonder they go into a life of crime or whatever. Well, it's not poverty that causes crime. You know, most of the most horrific stealing that goes on in our country was rich people. There was that story the other day about the person who had quote-unquote earned $4 billion last year. And then as the writer said, nobody earns four billion dollars a year. They can take it, but they can't earn it. And at the same time, talking about people from a poor, disadvantaged background, you look at the forest tradition. These were mostly peasants' sons. And if they were condemned to a life of poverty by the fact that they were born poor, and a life of crime. We would never would have had the forest tradition. There were poor people and they realized, okay, here we are poor, but we do have what it needs what is needed for the practice. This is the point that John Munn made over and over again. You have a human body, you have a human mind, you've got what is needed for the practice. Use it. It's interesting to note that there were basically two reform movements going on in Buddhism at the time. There was one that was coming from the top down, and there was another one coming from the bottom up, and the one from the bottom up was the one that was more in line with the Dharma. The one that went Westerners went over to study in Thailand, that's the one they chose, because it had more to offer. So the effort, the energy put in the practice doesn't have to depend on outside circumstances. In fact, you have to overcome outside circumstances, not them, let them loom large in the mind. I talked last night about the differences between truths of the observer and truths of the will. Well, the practice is very much a truth of the will, in the sense that if you don't stir up your will, as the Buddha says, generate desire, activate your persistence and your energy uphold your intent. It's not going to happen. This is something that becomes true because you will it to be true. You will the path. Each of the factors requires right effort, which requires an element of will, starting from right view and all the way through right concentration. And so it's the strength of your will, the strength of your determination. That really makes all the difference. In the John Munn's final sermon, he talked about how the warrior is the warrior requires discernment, requires mindfulness and concentration as its support, as his his or her support. Oh, well, who is the warrior? The warrior is the determination not to come back and be the laughing stock of the defilements. Those are John Munn's words. They're determined not to come back and suffer over and over again. Because you look at the world, all the different ways that the beings of the world suffer. I mean, it's bad enough being a human being with all the wars, with all the conflicts, with all the insanity that goes on in the human race. then there's a possibility that you might slip down lower than the human level. 
the life of a common animal. And the common animals live largely in fear. They have no understanding of what's going on. They're just driven by fear all the time. So as the Buddha said, when you have a sense of heedfulness, this is what enables you to develop all the other skillful qualities. This is the root of what's skillful. And this is the root of your energy. It's a mental quality that gives you the energy to practice. The mind is primary, the body is secondary. They should work together, but the mind should always be in charge and we should always have top priority. Because it's the energy of mind that will see you through. Because you want an energy that doesn't have to depend on the body, because after all, there will come a time when the body gets too sick, even to sit up, too old, and it's going to die. And you want to have your mind strong enough so that its strength is not affected by those events that happen to the body. And that's a strength that's independent of the body. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're working on. And it starts by developing what strength of mind you have now. Really taking seriously the fact that aging, illness, and death come. And it's in that conversation between Ratapala and the king. Even a king can't say, okay, I've got this illness right now. I demand that my courtiers, I demand that my subjects share out the pain of this illness so I don't have to feel so much pain. You can't do that. You have to face the pain on your own. And so you want to have the qualities of mind that can help you deal with that pain and not get overcome by it. Which is why strength of mind always has to come first. <laughs>